This conference will now be recorded. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today and happy Wednesday. Happy spring seminar day two or talk two. Um, welcome again, 2021 spring eco foci seminar. I am Heather Tavasola and I co-run the series with Jens Nielsen. This seminar is part of NOAA's eco foci biannual seminar series that is focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, the Bering Sea, and the U.S. Arctic to improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, and provoke conversation on subjects pertaining to fisheries oceanography, regional issues in Alaska's marine ecosystems, and that includes the U.S. Arctic. You can visit the ECOFOSI webpage for more information at www.ecofoci.noaa.gov. And again, we thank you so much for joining us today, especially as we continue an all virtual series. You can find our spe speaker lineup um, on the One NOAA Seminar Series website and also on the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. We are here in March at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays um, just through the end of this month for spring seminar. If you've missed a seminar, we do uh, record them and most are posted on the PMEL YouTube page. It does take a few weeks to get these up, um, so they are not immediate for the current seminar, but you should be able to find last seasons posted. Please double check that your microphones are muted, that you are not using video. And then during the talk, please do feel free to type your questions into the chat. Jens will be monitoring the questions and we will address those at the end with Aaron. So today I'm very excited to introduce um, Aaron Fadawa, who is a fisheries biologist at the NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Kodiak. Erin uh, is a um, part of the shellfish assessment program where she conducts research on Eastern Bering Sea commercial crab stocks. Prior to join joining NOAA, she completed her master's degree at Oregon State University, where she studied flatfish trait variation across life history stages using otolith structural analysis. After completing grad school, she's worked as a research scientist for Auburn University's Marine Fish Lab and spent a year conducting reef fish habitat research in Trinidad as part of a Fulbright Research Fellowship. Erin's research interests are centered around exploring how environmental variability drives changes in population processes and ecosystem dynamics. And today, Erin's talk will focus on a record high Bering Sea water temperatures in 2018 and 2019 that were accompanied by dramatic shifts in snow crab population structure and will highlight the importance of ongoing and future research efforts to better understand snow crab responses to continued warming. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today, Erin. So I'll let you take it away. Awesome, thanks for that introduction, Heather. You got me all right? Sound is good? Yes, we can hear you, thank you. Awesome. Um, morning, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and advance. Title slide. Um, thanks for having me today. I'm going to spend uh, a bit of time uh, today talking about, as Heather said, some recent work examining the effect of climate warming um, on snow crab, uh, specifically spatial distributions and thermal habitat use. And then from there, I'd uh, like to just highlight a few. Uh, ongoing snow crab projects here at the shellfish assessment program that will hopefully continue to shed light on um, snow crab responses to continued warming. Uh, so with that, for those of you that don't work with snow crab, uh, this is probably a more accurate depiction of what comes to mind. The Eastern Bering Sea supports one of the largest snow crab fisheries in the world. Um, so just to give you an idea, the um, TAC was set at uh, 45 million pounds this year for the 2020-21 snow crab fishery. The fishery is male only and um, takes place in the winter with uh, boats typically fishing right up against the pack ice. So uh, it really makes for um, very dangerous conditions as well as apparently good uh, TV, as many of you might be familiar with. 
And we also can't ignore the fact that uh, this fishery is driven by a demand for tasty snow crab legs. Um, so now that we're all dreaming about um, buffets with snow crab legs, everyone's hungry, uh, we can put this fishery into context. Snow crab are found uh, in subarctic and arctic regions, and um, there are populations in both the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas. Uh, this light blue shaded area um, shows the uh, southeastern Bering Sea representing the southern extent of snow crab range in the North Pacific where uh, we see snow crab really concentrated on the middle shelf in uh, the cold pool. Uh, the fishery that we just talked about is uh, depicted by this uh, yellow shaded region and has uh, historically centered uh, northwest of the Pribilofs, kind of along uh, Zemchung Canyon. And this is uh, primarily because our seasonal sea ice in the Bering Sea really has limited access to uh, northern, more northern fishery grounds during this winter fishery. And uh, we know that uh, the Eastern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea are really characterized as two very different ecosystems. Uh, this is defined largely by difference is, uh, differences in temperatures and sea ice coverage with uh, the Northern Bering Sea functioning as an Arctic system and the Eastern Bering Sea functioning more. And uh, if you watched last week's Ecofoci seminar, uh, Mike is a hard act to follow, but he made my job a bit easier actually, because he really did an excellent job explaining some of the fundamental differences between these two ecosystems. Um, so hopefully you can uh, either call his talk or can watch it recorded um, kind of as a, a preface to some of the work that we've done with snow crab. Well, historic uh, snow crab distributions have uh, really been explained by uh, the cold pool and sea ice extent. Uh, we've seen that spatial patterns across the Eastern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea are linked to um, both size and sex specific thermal requirements. Uh, this plot on the left is showing um, catch compositions from uh, the Northern Bering Sea and Eastern Bering Sea um, AFSC bottom trawl survey. And we can really see these um, latitudinal clines in snow crab population structure. So those, um, those shaded areas are showing um, size compositions based on um, immature versus mature, as well as um, sexes across the uh, Northern and Eastern Bering Sea. And we really uh, can note that on the Northern Bering Sea, it kind of distinguished by, between that um, divide between our two survey grids. Uh, cold temperatures in the Northern Bering Sea have led to um, historically small mature populations. So in the Northern Bering Sea, we typically see um, few individuals that are larger than 60 millimeters carapace width. And the Northern Bering Sea really serves as um, a larval sink. So there's uh, typically no commercially sized males. Um, most of the catch is small, um, immature snow crab. And moving down to the Eastern Bering Sea, we see kind of this, um, this variation in distribution in terms of um, size specific thermal requirements. So you'll note that um, kind of that, that northeastern corner of the Eastern Bering Sea grid is where we find most of our juvenile snow crab. And this is because they prefer um, these shallow cold water habitats uh, kind of northeast of uh, St. Matthew Island. And we typically find um, mature snow crab in warmer waters off of the outer domain. In snow crab, um, spatial distributions are characterized um, kind of bigger picture by these northeast to southwest ontogenetic migrations. And these are thought to be driven by uh, thermal gradients. So as, as snow crab mature, they're really seeking those warmer waters on the outer shelf, whereas juveniles, um, you know, really prefer those colder waters. 
And if you're um, more of a visual person like me, this is kind of uh, what, what the Northern Bering Sea versus Eastern Bering Sea uh, snow crab population structure looks like. So you'll see uh, that top picture is a pretty typical, um, you know, snapshot of catches in the Northern Bering Sea. So we see that um, small, immature snow crop really dominate the benthic biomass in the Northern Bering Sea. Whereas that bottom picture in the Eastern Bering Sea, um, especially if we're around areas like the Pribilofs, we tend to get a mixed catch, um, sometimes uh, tanner crab mixed in with snow crab, and then to make matters worse, um, those, those two species hybridize, so we have snow tanner hybrids, as well as kind of more of this um, mix of uh, size sex classes in the Eastern Bering Sea, depending on where we are on the shelf. Uh, so why are these north-south distinctions important for snow crab? Well, um, we know that these north-south boundaries that really separate Arctic and subarctic ecosystems have begun to shift. Um, so shown on the left, uh, we've seen anomalous conditions in both the Eastern Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea with um, this uh, plot showing that 2018 marked the smallest coal pool and lowest sea ice extent on record. And then um, off to the right, we've seen pollock, uh, walleye pollock and Pacific cod uh, have undergone these extensive northward migrations into the northern Bering Sea uh, as a potential response to a retreating cold pool. So this, you know, this kind of lends us to ask, ask the question, uh, what does this mean for Arctic species like snow crab? Uh, it's it, you know it's interesting to note when thinking about snow crab responses that previous studies have noted this um, contraction to the north of snow crab range in the Eastern Bering Sea, and this was following an increase in bottom temperatures in the late 1970s, which is shown this figure on the left um, from a study. Uh, this evidence for climate-driven uh, range contraction uh, suggests that continued warming could drive a similar range contraction north um, for snow crab, and this could be driven by um, those specific thermal habitat requirements that we just talked about. Another potential response to warming uh, might be a shift in uh, population processes, um, for example, growth. Uh, body size, size at maturity. We've seen uh, snow crab that inhabit colder waters in our northern latitudes like the northern Bering Sea are smaller, um, so smaller carapace width as shown on the y-axis of this figure on the left, as well as uh, these crab in northern latitudes are maturing at smaller sizes. So well, um, Changes in growth, uh, molt frequency, and uh, maturation size could be attributed to uh, warmer temperatures. Uh, we might also you know, expect that these latitudinal climes could shift um, also in response to um, migration into the northern Bering Sea. So as, um, as the, this eastern Bering Sea population that consists of you know, our larger mature individuals move into the Northern Bering Sea and um, basically cause shifts in these uh, demographic processes. So now that we've formulated um, some hypotheses, we can begin to develop um, some potential mechanisms for these climate-driven hypotheses. In uh, my little cartoon under a warm scenario, as shown here, um, we'd expect that these suitable uh, cold water temperatures could begin to disappear for snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea. Uh, and as a result, uh, the Northern Bering Sea could become relatively more important as suitable habitat. So uh, we then uh, expect, as we talked about earlier, to see this population range contraction northward. And it's important to recognize that with snow crab, this could happen uh, kind of via two different mechanisms. So we talked about this um, Eastern Bering Sea migration into the Northern Bering Sea, as well as 
Um, you'll remember I mentioned that northeast to southwest oncogenic migration. And if, if these um, you know, small juvenile snow crabs in the northeast are tracking thermal gradients, then they may, um, you know, as conditions warm, these migrations are basically shortened as uh, the thermal gradients that they're tracking are shifting. And then kind of the other um, the other potential response is uh, these shifts in demographic structure that we just talked about. So this might be via range contraction northward, um, and you would expect to see a potential response um, detected as an increase in both overall abundance and a change in the proportion of large snow crab in the Northern Bering Sea if we see evidence for this range contraction northward, as well as kind of some of these potential longer term effects um, such as shifts in growth, molt frequency and size of maturity. So uh, this is a study and I'd just like to acknowledge my collaborators on, uh, down in the bottom right hand corner. Um, this was uh, just published this year uh, and given some of these hypotheses we really set out to examine um, patterns in uh, temperatures occupied and um, patterns in spatial distribution of snow crab during both um, cold and warm periods in the Bering Sea. So the kind of overall specific goal of the study was to um, evaluate the hypothesis that increased temperatures or temperatures occupied experienced by snow crab and uh, the potential for climate driven northward range contraction in the eastern Bering Sea uh, could result in uh, this changing demographic structure of northern Bering Sea snow crab. Um, so with that, I won't get too into the methods here, but uh, we developed um, annual environmental indices to describe um, Eastern Bering Sea thermal conditions and cold dynamics. And then on the right hand side are snow crab spatial indices uh, we developed to examine both uh, thermal requirements uh, and spatial structure across um, multiple snow crab life history stages. So these um, temperatures of occupancy, spatial extent, and centers of distribution were estimated across um, oncogenic stages for male and female snow crab, which resulted in um, five different size sex categories that you'll see throughout results in the talk. From there, environmental variables, um, were used for um, temperature of occupancy cross correlations and um, models to really look at the relative importance of environmental covariates as drivers of these uh, snow crab spatial indices. And um, because we know a lot of these environmental variables are highly correlated, we used um, dynamic factor analysis to summarize trends in these variables. And you can see that shared trend on the left uh, really captures that um, rapid warming during um, 2014 to 2018, which was really you know, outside of the envelope of observations that we've seen in the time series. So again, our, our first question looking at um, trends in snow crab occupancy temperatures relative bottom temperatures. That top figure, uh, each color is a temperature of occupancy time series for a different size sex class. And that black line is the population mean. So again, we're asking if um, these patterns are correlated with bottom temperatures, that um, plot on the bottom showing a uh, mean bottom temperature. So for example, weak correlations in this case um, would suggest that snow crab could potentially, um, are potentially able to buffer changes in these thermal regimes in the Eastern Bering Sea by basically being able to maintain a constant temperature of occupancy. And just noting um, general trends in temperature of occupancy uh, we can see in, in 2018, um, you know, kind of across the board for these size sex categories, we see this 
huge jump in um, temperatures of occupancy for all uh, categories of snow crab. And this uh, population mean was almost three degrees C above uh, the, the mean of the time series. And then as well as uh, these cross correlations, uh, we saw that snow crab temperatures of occupancy were highly correlated with um, average bottom temperatures. Uh, it's also interesting to point out though, that uh, we see this uh, kind of interesting three year decoupling in our um, immature females and small males. So if you look on that top temperature of occupancy plot, those um, bottom two uh, time series, the, uh, the blue and the gray lines are immature females and small males. And um, basically we see in uh, 2014, bottom temperatures in the Eastern Spring Sea increased by um, nearly a degree and a half C, but uh, immature females and small males really were able to uh, maintain temperatures of occupancy around uh, zero degrees from 2015 to 2017. So you know, this um, suggests that um, maybe our, our immature, these small juvenile snow crab we're somehow able to uh, maintain these cold water preferences despite these increasing bottom temperatures that we see across the Eastern Bay Sea. And uh, a mechanism for this um, thermal buffering could be through, as we talked about, relocation to colder water habitats as the Eastern so looking at um, distributions, um, thermal distributions across this time period, this plot is showing um, abundance of a juvenile snow crab overlaid on bottom temperatures in the Eastern Bering Sea during the summer survey. Um, we see kind of moving from left to right that juvenile snow crab really always appear in these, these kind of Northeast nursery areas in the Eastern Bering Sea. So typically, um, northeast of St. Matthew Island. And these, you know, nursery areas tend to be, um, you know, in the cold pool and relatively colder, uh, you know, related to the rest of the Eastern Bering Sea. We know that these juvenile snow crab are fairly limited in terms of mobility just because they're, you know, typically 30 millimeters carapace width, they're pretty small. Um, and this really suggests that our juveniles can't, can't seek out these preferred cold water habitats. So we kind of see as we work along um, in 2018 and 2019, this um, preferred habitat of uh, you know, less than two degrees C has been uh, nearly absent in these two years. Uh, so occupancy temperatures um, increased dramatically as a result. And so, you know, kind of the takeaway message here is that uh, it seems that juvenile snow crab are kind of stuck with the cards they're dealt in this case. They, they're, you know, um, based on larval infection patterns, they really end up in these Northeast nursery habitats um, and are just, just really lack the ability to relocate um, if, if the Bering Sea is warming, especially in these nursery areas. So to, to summarize this, those couple of points that we just talked about, um, James Murphy actually just published uh, a really neat paper that shows um, predicted posterior means of biomass for snow crab um, by population category across a range of um, temperature values, which is shown on the bottom. And uh, this, this solid line is showing um, specifically immature female snow crab biomass. And his results uh, really suggest that uh, immature snow crab, um, specifically females, are highly sensitive to temperature. And um, two degrees C really appears to be this um, temperature threshold for our, our juvenile snow crab. Whereas uh, we know based on uh, previous studies that we really don't start to see negative effects on larger mature snow crab until temperatures exceed um, six to seven degrees C. So potentially these warmer temperatures 
plants um, on the outer shelf are still within the thermal threshold of our larger snow crab. Um, whereas a juvenile snow crab uh, could be highly vulnerable to warming in the Eastern Bering Sea. Our second objective uh, was to look at potential drivers of snow crab distribution. Uh, these uh, top plots showing mean bottom temperatures there on the left with um, stars indicating uh, northern Bering Sea bottom temperatures for the four years that um, region was surveyed on our bottom trough survey. And um, looking at our snow crab spatial indices, that top right plot is showing um, the, on the y-axis is um, spatial extent of snow crab miles. And again, those um, colored time series are, are five different size sex categories. Um, you'll see that um, large males and females tend to have the largest spatial extent just because um, they have the most mobility, as we've just talked about. Um, and you'll kind of see this, um, you know, trend in overall spatial ex population level spatial extent remaining um, well below average uh, since 2015. Looking at um, centers of distribution there on the y-axis of our next um, spatial indicator, um, centers of distribution really differ greatly across our size sex categories, but we kind of see these broad population level trends. So you'll kind of notice that um, centers of distribution shifted south um, from 2010 to 2014, and then we kind of see this reversal in a shift northward again um, in 2014 when we know those bottom temperatures started to increase. So we then use these environmental variables and snow crab spatial indices to look at um, the relative importance of a shared environmental trend on both snow crab spatial extent and centers of distribution. Um, this figure uh, shows that uh, the spatial extent of snow crab on the y-axis there decreased um, significantly in relation to warming tracked by the shared environmental trend. And this, um, this response was consistent across our size sex categories. So basically, um, what we're saying is that these um, increased temperatures reduced um, smaller, more northerly cold pool extent basically results in a smaller area occupied by snow crab. And contrary to our hypotheses, our um, latitudinal distribution shifts were not explained by um, these this shared environmental trends. So to summarize this, our um, lack of support for you know, a directional shift north is um, obviously contrary to what we expected. Um, although it's, it's interesting to know, as we saw in those center of distribution trends, that um, centers of distribution really still, still tend to reflect thermal regimes. So we saw that kind of five years southward shift and then a reversal in 2014 um, when warming began in the Eastern Bering Sea. And then on the other side of this, um, spatial extent of snow crab in the Eastern Bering Sea uh, has contracted kind of in response to this um, warmer temperature, uh, smaller cold pool conditions in the Eastern Bering Sea. And it's interesting that we really didn't see evidence for a density dependent range contraction, um, which you know potentially suggests that these um, you know climate forcing could be more important than uh, density dependent processes, although this obviously requires some um, some further work. And so I, you know kind of the take home message or the remaining question from this is, um, you know, is this a reduction in spatial extent potentially due to kind of this loss of, um, you know, this habitat that's typically utilized on the, the outer domain of the East Bering Sea? So is it, is it potentially that in warm years, uh, these cross shelf northeast to southwest migrations are really contracted to the middle domain as these um, outer domain waters warm? 
And our, our last question in this study was to um, compare abundance and size structure of northern Bering Sea snow crab across years um, under the hypothesis that um, this northward range contraction into the northern Bering Sea might shift um, these latitudinal climbs that we've seen. And these two figures, um, these are violin plots of Northern Bering Sea male and female size distributions across um, the four years that the Northern Bering Sea was surveyed. So the um, shaded area represents um, probability densities of size composition data and the box plots um, within those little violins um, summarize the median as well as um, 75th and 20th percentiles of population size. So uh, the takeaways here being that uh, looking at males on the left first, we see that that, um, that median size of males in 2019 was, um, was over 25% larger than males, uh, male sizes in 2010. And then kind of uh, something similar moving to the right and looking at females, we see that um, the median size in 2019 was 13% greater than uh, median size in 2010. So uh, the, you know, the take home is that these, these size compositions that were seen in 2019 are a dramatic contrast to what's been previously documented in the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, we also looked at abundances uh, in both the Eastern and Northern Bering Sea to uh, and evaluate this hypothesized um, potential shift into the Northern Bering Sea and uh, resulting changes in Northern Bering Sea snow crab demographic structure. So this plot is showing um, abundance of snow crab on the y-axis for our size sex categories that were used for the study. And uh, we see in the Eastern Bering Sea these, these really dramatic declines in um, small males and immature female snow crab from 2018 to 2019. So, you know, you're talking for females um, in particular, immature females, a 96% decrease in immature female abundance. And moving over to uh, the Northern Bering Sea, we see these um, similar declines in the same size sex categories. So our small males and immature females um, these cross-region declines in um, juvenile snow crab abundance. And then as, as we've just seen in the violin plot, these um, medium to large size males, we see this substantial increase in abundance from 2018 to 2019, which was really confirmed in those um, violin plots that we saw in the last slide. So to, um, to kind of take a step back and, um, you know, summarize some of these results, uh, we see this uh, distinctly different size structure in 2019, um, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not clear where all these large crab came from because we really didn't see this directional shift north from the Eastern Bering Sea. If we look at um, distributions of um, snow crab from the Eastern Bering Sea Bottom Troll Survey, or sorry, Eastern and Northern Bering Sea Bottom Troll Survey in 2018, uh, we can kind of see this, this aggregation of legal sized male snow crab. So that kind of red blob up by the um, NBS EBS border. And this, um, you know, this could suggest uh, kind of this continuous distribution of snow crab between the two regions and you know it's possible that those center of distribution spatial indices just really didn't didn't effectively capture this this ship north and in, in a smaller portion of the legal male um, the population and then uh, you know the other side for this is that warming it could also be responsible for um, increased growth potential and molt frequency that um, might explain the presence of these large individuals in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, we obviously can't exclude the possibility that cohorts within our northern Bering Sea study area in 2017 
could have grown to these sizes that were documented in 2019 under these warming temperatures. Um, so this, this figure just depicting, you know, kind of this potential for increasing size distributions being evidence of a cohort growth, suggesting that we're instead looking at this modal progression of a single cohort across years. And then uh, going back to those dramatic declines that we saw in juvenile snow crab abundance in both the eastern and northern Bering Sea, does this suggest a potential mortality event? And you'll remember that, that we saw those high catches of immature snow crab uh, at Eastern Bering Sea survey stations in 2018 that were occupying temperatures um, greater than three degrees C, uh, followed by you know, the next year in 2019 at those same stations, we see those dramatic declines. So is it possible that you know, there's um, some uh, direct temperature effects on survival when they occupy those temperatures that are warmer than they really prefer. Um, and in case you were still hungry thinking about those crab legs, this, uh, this picture on the left I took uh, on the northern Bering Sea Bottom Trail Survey. This is a Pacific cod with a stomach full of uh, their favorite prey, all of our little snow crab that we know are up in the northern Bering Sea. And you know this suggests uh, that declines in immature snow crab could, uh, you know, potentially be due to increased predation, as we know these thermal barriers um, are really beginning to disappear. That have, you know, kind of protected juvenile snow crab from uh, Pacific cod predation. And this uh, this plot on the right shows Pacific cod snow crab spatial overlap in the northern Bering Sea. And we see this um, you know, substantial increase in spatial overlap from uh, 43% to 88% in 2017. And then 2018 and 19, uh, spatial overlap was almost 100%. And then we of course you know, really can't, um, can't ignore the, these other confounding processes. You know, it's, it's possible that these declines are due to um, selectivity or catchability, uh, as well as movement outside of the survey grid, which, um, you know, really, uh, it was the kind of loss in, in a 2020 survey was, you know, not being able to, to ask this question of whether this cohort materialized last year and maybe these declines in abundance um, could have been due to something else. So it's, um, it'll be interesting to see survey results this year to kind of see you know, whether, whether that was a mortality event. And, you know, kind of to wrap this um, portion of the talk up, uh, you know, what does the future hold for snow crab? Uh, the safest answer probably is to say that I don't know. <laughs> And I, you know, I think we've recognized that uh, we could continue to see this um, broader population level range contraction as well as, um, you know, these predation effects on snow crab spatial distributions and demographic structure. Um, these study results also, uh, you know, kind of emphasize the need to determine if uh, these large males that we're seeing in the northern Bering Sea are migrating southward uh, to fishing grounds during the winter. And that might warrant the uh, inclusion of Northern Bering Sea survey data in the stock assessment, which um, currently only uses Eastern Bering Sea data. Obviously, our um, survey results or study results are limited to kind of a this small um, summer window during surveys. So, um, you know, the need to extend work to understand what these populations are doing during the winter and spring months. Um, and as well <clears throat> as just kind of highlighting, um, you know, as, as the Northern Bering Sea warms, this boundary between the Eastern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea is, uh, you know, will continue to lack biological meaning as well as, um, you know, meaning for snow crab management. So this figure on the right is just a little uh, screenshot of the um, sea ice extent and concentration um, I think this was last week, just to give uh, you guys a snapshot of what it looks like out there right now. And this 
This arrow is just kind of highlighting the location of the highest catches to date for the fishery that's still going on right now. So, you know, these these boats are really, um, really just right up against the pack ice and it, it kind of um, makes you question how the fleet will respond, um, you know, as the Eastern Bering Sea is ice free for longer uh, alongside these potential population level distribution shifts. So obviously, uh, like any study, we're left with a lot of questions as we try to clarify these um, snow crab driver response relationship. Uh, so this slide is um, my shameless plug to advertise these uh, kind of inherent difficulties of working with crab. And I'm hoping that uh, you know, after you see this portion of the talk, you'll maybe you'll go by any of your uh, crab biologist or stock assessment author friends a beer because um, it's complicated. <laughs> so uh, just to you know provide some proof or some backup to my argument, um, to quantify these driver response relationships, we really need to first be able to um, measure these species specific responses and uh, difficulties in determining Basic crab life history parameters really leave us with a lot of data gaps and unknowns. And uh, likewise, we have, uh, you know, I would argue that we have a pretty comprehensive understanding of pelagic energy flow in the Bering Sea. Um, we've linked ground fish recruitment to environmental conditions, um, prey quality, and overwinter mortality. But uh, um, in the Eastern Bering Sea in particular, um, benthic. Uh, species like crab have really kind of been left out of the picture. And, uh, you know, lastly, we, we don't really have a good understanding of what drives large changes in year class strength in um, snow crab. So I'll just take um, the remaining uh, five to 10 minutes to just highlight uh, some current research that's going on um, at the Shellfish Assessment Program to um, address some of these data gaps. And in case you were um, still scratching your head, no, crab do not have otoliths. So, um, you know, that, that obviously means that we have no way to reliably age um, crab. We can use uh, things like uh, shell condition uh, indices, which are really indirect proxies and are, are highly subjective. Uh, we can use a more direct method uh, like radiometric shell age estimation, which is um, based on this assumption that radium is incorporated into the exoskeleton of uh, crustaceans, which then decays to thorium with time. So um, we can use this technique to estimate maximum age of snow crab following their um, final molt to maturity. And kind of the problem here is that uh, past radiometric studies uh, have used, our past studies used um, only three individuals, very old shell individuals to estimate maximum age of snow crab, which um, calls into question, you know, age estimates that are used in the current snow crab stock assessment. So um, this is a, a cooperative study funded through NCRAP to um, use radiometric aging to hopefully improve these maximum age and natural mortality estimates in the snow crab stock assessment. And then uh, kind of alongside of this, some more cooperative research, um, growth in uh, crab is obviously uh, very different than fish and is uh, characterized by, in our uh, later benthic instar stages of crab, an annual molt in the spring. So this obviously complicates things because we basically have to go out um, to the Bering Sea and collect these crab uh, prior to the spring molt and then bring them back into the lab and hold them and wait for them to molt to be able to obtain these, uh, these growth increment data. So, uh, you know, because of this difficulty, uh, growth models in the snow crab stock assessment are missing a growth per molt data across the entire range of immature size classes. So I'm actually um, headed out to sea in a couple weeks to uh, go out there and bring these crab back to fill in some of these data gaps and hopefully eventually get at some of these uh, low-hanging fruit questions looking at, um, you know, 
temperature dependent uh, growth rates, and uh, kind of other questions and looking at uh, tying those back into uh, changing climate. Another basic life history parameter, size of maturity, is um, complicated because males molt to maturity across uh, a wide range of sizes. And this is accompanied by um, you know, morphometric changes in their chela or their large claw, which you effectively have to measure to determine whether a male is mature or immature. So understanding um, potential shifts in size of maturity is important because um, males that molt to maturity below the industry preferred size, which is shown by the black um, vertical line in this plot, really have no economic value and are thrown back as discards. So you then expect if um, you know population level size of maturity estimates decrease relative to this um, you know static industry preferred size, then effectively less males are available for harvest. And this has been um, a really hot topic with industry after high discards in the fishery last year. And um, the Bering Sea Fisheries Research Foundation just hosted um, you know kind of a cross region workshop on this topic and um, several great papers have just come out on it. So I'm sure there's, there's more to come on this topic. And then, you know, kind of transitioning to this understanding of benthic energy flow. Um, characterizing crab diets is complicated by this, um, you know, this lovely gastric mill, which basically functions a bit like a gizzard in a bird. So this means that, um, you know, stomach content analysis is very difficult. It's basically impossible to ID uh, or even quantify prey items. And we often compare uh, stomach content analysis with stable isotope analysis. And this is just some um, preliminary stable isotope analysis we ran in 2018 showing um, potential variation in energy densities of snow crab collected on the bottom trail survey, suggesting that these energy densities really vary by sampling location. Um, so to continue some of this food habits work, um, we'll be running a diet study this spring in collaboration with um, Wes Larson at the AFSC Genetics Lab to pilot the use of um, eDNA metabarcoding to analyze crab diets with the hopes to then um, expand this to obviously uh, survey collected crab. And the, the second part to kind of understanding energy transfer is, uh, you know, this question of uh, snow crab energetics. It's not known uh, whether energetics could ultimately be, a, you know, a limiting factor in juvenile snow crab survival and recruitment success since uh, past studies suggest uh, that snow crab really rely on reaching a physiological um, threshold for body condition and require baseline energetic stores uh, to survive through the molting process. So indirect proxies like our length weight residuals are really insensitive for crab, um, whereas more direct methods like uh, lipid and fatty acid analysis really allow us to directly quantify uh, things like body condition, energy allocation, and relationship. Uh, so Luis Koopman led a recent study um, showing that juvenile snow and tanner crab um, collected in a warm year in the Eastern Bering Sea had lower total fatty acids and diatom fatty acid biomarkers than crab collected from a cold year in the Eastern Bering Sea. Uh, with this figure on the left here showing annual and regional differences in that diatom indicator. So these, um, these results are exciting because they really provide uh, some of the first evidence linking warming events to reduce energetic condition, as well as kind of highlighting the importance of diatom production um, for snow crab. And we'll continue this work. Um, Luis and I are working on an NPRB funded project to uh, quantify variation in energy or energetic condition um, and these energy allocation patterns and then hopefully um, link these energetic patterns to bottom temperatures and snow crab recruitment. 
And then, uh, you know, kind of lastly, this, um, you know, ultimate black box of early life history, um, understanding recruitment variation and early life history dynamics of snow crab. Um, to date, very few studies have been conducted on larval snow crab, but um, Buck Stockhausen has been working on a spatially explicit, explicit IBM for snow crab, which um, uses the ROMS model, physical environment, um, with these end locations for uh, simulated successful and unsuccessful snow crab based on uh, temperature dependent intermolar durations that he's included in these simulations. So I don't, I don't want to steal his thunder here, but um, this is an example output of some of his results with those red dots showing um, unsuccessful individuals that didn't re reach nursery habitats. Um, by the end of the simulation based on different start zones. And modeling applications like these really obviously benefit from uh, field collected data to um, validate these spatiotemporal distributions of snow crab larval stages. Um, to date, um, you know, our NOAA larval surveys don't typically ID decapods to species, uh, so we're hoping uh, this spring to collect some uh, ichthyoplankton samples from the uh, EBS mooring survey to hopefully start up some of this early life history work. Um, and then with that, you know, kind of a maybe a strange closing slide, but to put to put all these pieces together is this, uh, you know, this obviously bigger picture effort towards ecosystem based fisheries management. These ecosystem and socioeconomic profiles, or ESPs, uh, have been developed to kind of serve as a proving ground for testing these uh, ecosystem and socioeconomic linkages within the stock assessment. And so I've been leading kind of the E portion of the ESPs, and uh, we're gearing up to uh, start a snow crab ESP this year. And you know, I guess uh, I'll close with with saying, in in trying to develop effective ecosystem indicators, it's really a great chance to um, talk to you all and you know hear what you've been doing and how your research might contribute to um, you know developing some of these ecosystem indicators. So uh, I'll close with just saying that you know I, I'd love to hear from you if you have data to contribute. Um, I'd love to hear from you regardless. <laughs> And it's, uh, it's been super fun to talk about crab. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Awesome, thank you, Erin. I always do claps because, well, nobody else can. So here we are. Anyway, <laughs> as weird as it sounds. Um, we actually have about five minutes. So I just want in our, in our hour block. So I wanna give folks the opportunity um, we will be here again next week. Um, Dr. Calvin Morty and Dr. Bonnie Chang will be talking about nutrients um, in the Chukchi Sea. And uh, again, this meeting has been recorded. So if you need to catch up on that or the questions that we can take following, uh, please feel free to message Jens and I and we can um, address that. Or please also reach out directly to Erin and you can uh, send your follow-up questions to her as well. Um, with that, I think, Erin, if you have the time, um, I know, um, sorry, I was just double checking. I know Ramundo was doing her presentation following, so I want to be mindful of that as well. Um, and that does start at 11. So I'm going to give folks, um, we'll, we'll cover the questions and I'll say we have like another five minutes to go over questions. And then after that, we'll have to close. Um, close the seminar. So Erin, really amazing talk. And I'm sure everybody else on here knows this. I did not know that cod ate crab. And I am literally in my mind trying to figure out how their system digests it right now. So that's what I'm 100% focused on. But <laughs> um, as Jens told me, he already knew that as well. So I clearly am just the last person in the world to know this. Um, and okay, so I'm just gonna go back and read some questions that were already on here. And if folks have new ones, again, please feel free to put them in the chat or just reach out to Erin uh, directly. So one of the questions that had come in before is from um, William or Bill Stockhausen. Um, and he had asked early on, 
Uh, snow crab instar sizes are reportedly extremely conservative in eastern Canada. Is this true in the Bering Sea across latitudes? So shifts in mean size reflect fewer molts prior to maturity. Yeah, great question, Buck. Um, you know, kind of the the idea behind these latitudinal climbs. Part of it, yes, is um, you know this this variation in intermolt duration. So basically, colder temperatures. Um, it it takes longer for crab, obviously. So this uh, you know duration is temperature dependent. But we also see, uh, and I'm sure Buck is familiar with this. In colder temperatures, we see skip molting more frequently. So because crab are kind of hunkered down in these really cold conditions, um, the, you know, they, they tend to skip molts. And because of that, they really just reach these smaller sizes at maturity. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure Buck can actually even add, elaborate more on that too. Uh, and Libby had also asked, what might be the mechanism for different temperature preferences um, of immature and adult crab? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, inherent mechanism, that's that's a tough one. I, you know, the thing that comes to mind is that um, it, I think largely a temperature preference, you know, it, it could just be that these immature snow crab really need these colder waters to be able to avoid predation um, from Pacific cod that typically don't inhabit, you know, these less than two degrees C waters. So it could just be that that we tend to find them in these colder waters because they're able to evade predators. Um, typically Pacific cod, unless they're uh, soft shell crab, cod really aren't feeding on, um, you know, larger mature snow crab just because they're too big in terms of gape width. So, you know, this this preference could just be because uh, we've historically seen them there as kind of a, a you know adaptation, if you will, to really avoid these uh, predators like cod. But um, yeah, that's a great question. I might have to follow up with that. All right, there's a couple questions on here from um, Jesse, and I think a follow up from Buck. But I'm going to actually skip to Melanie's question. <laughs> <laughs> which is how would you characterize the cross shelf use by snow crab inner versus middle versus outer domains is there more north south movement during their life cycle or is it more movement east west also important yeah great question as well um for snow crab it, it really seems to be that kind of northeast to southwest as i've said but i i would say directionally more um north to south and we've kind of seen some um some recent papers come out that that suggests with um, projected warming, we'll continue to see these shifts north, whereas a species like tanner crab, uh, we might see more of these east-west shifts in distribution. Um, so yeah, cross shelf, if that answered the question, I would definitely say more north to south movement, just because it seems that that northern Bering Sea is really kind of a larval sink. And, and then we see all of those mature crab down in you know, southern portions of the Eastern Bering Sea. So it, it really, you know, lends to suggesting that that more south movement is, is more important. Awesome. All right, and then Jesse's question, and we'll end with this one. Is rearing um, these crabs in the laboratory conditions possible? And then he was guessing that maybe there's issues with cannibalism, certain sizes similar to other species and lobsters and yeah, yeah, many issues with cannibalism. Um, and the, the girl study is a great example of that. So crab love to eat each other when they're little, when they're soft shell, uh, they're like little monsters. So in a study like the girl study, when we know crab are molting, you might have seen that picture of the crab in the Tupperware. We actually have to isolate every single crab so that they're not eating each other. Um, and if you ever get a chance to, um, you know, if you're ever up in Kodiak, we'd love to show you, well, maybe post-COVID, <laughs> um, we'd love to show you this seawater facility because it's, it's pretty impressive what the group here has been able to do um, in the lab in terms of rearing. And we've had, uh, you know, overall great luck with rearing them. Um, snow crab larvae really is is the difficulty in terms of rearing larvae, but I know um, Newport has had good luck with that. So um, red king crab larvae, you can definitely rear, um, but yeah, it's you have to be mindful of 
it's like cannibalism for sure. Do they, is it as, are they as cannibalistic in, in the ocean as they are in like a tank? Yeah, if if population densities are high enough, it's kind of assumed that, you know, it, it's interesting that some studies have tried to factor in cannibalism. Um, you know, it, a lot of it in the field, we just don't know, but I would assume so. They really like to eat each other. I always think of the images on Blue Planet when, like, I never knew crabs did this, but like those mass amounts of crabs and they're just crawling over each other. And I never dawned on me but it was yeah. pretty cool to see yeah all right Erin thank you so much I'm gonna end recording here thank you for those who are still with us again if you have um, questions please reach out to Erin directly or would like her slides again um, recordings of the talks from this season will be up um, in a few weeks so they are not immediately available um, and you can find the rest of the schedule on the one NOAA uh, science seminar website or also at the NOAA Pacific Marine Environmental Lab calendar of events. Thank you guys for joining us today.